Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. Today's conversation features composer, multi-instrumentalist, and writer Michael Hurst. Originally a native of Virginia, Michael moved to Park Slope, Brooklyn in 2001 and quickly found his way into a creative scene of musicians and writers. By the time he moved to Brooklyn, he had already formed a musical partnership with his college friend Joshua Camp. They perform and record under the name One Ring Zero, and the duo relocated to New York around the same time. I've been aware of Michael since I moved to Park Slope in 2005. The wonderful little music venue in the neighborhood called Barbess has a large painting of Michael and Josh on one of the walls, and One Ring Zero was one of the house bands at the venue for many years. And the coffee shop next to Barbess, which is called Colson's, sells a collection of CDs and books next to the cash register, all of which are either Michael Hurst or One Ring Zero projects. So it was hard not to wonder, who are these people? I have to confess, it was over the course of many mornings while I waited for my coffee that I started to pay attention to the CDs at the counter. One of them, a CD called As Smart As We Are, features music written and performed by One Ring Zero, with lyrics by notable authors including Paul Auster, Rick Moody, Jonathan Lethem, Jonathan Ames, and Dave Eggers. It was Eggers who helped introduce Hearst to the community of other writers in Brooklyn, in large part by inviting One Ring Zero to be the kind of house band at his little storefront publishing office on 7th Avenue in Brooklyn, the original office of what would become Edgar's publishing empire, McSweeney's. Following As Smart As We Are, which is sometimes called The Author Project, Michael embarked on a number of interesting and unusual creative projects, sometimes in collaboration with One Ring Zero, other times individually. His solo CD, Songs for Ice Cream Trucks, is literally music inspired by ice cream trucks, and in a wonderful twist of fate, it has become somewhat of a standard fixture in the ice cream truck musical universe. I say that in complete seriousness, as he tells me in our conversation. There are dozens of ice cream trucks across the country that are playing his songs as they patrol their neighborhood streets. Michael is project-oriented, generally immersing himself in a given subject matter or aesthetic universe for the duration of the project and then moving on to something new. He says, I love to set limitations on my work. I've always been fascinated with the project and setting boundaries. Hearst often finds inspiration in the music and artists he loves, especially the ones he loved as a child, and he tends to reframe them in a new context or engage them in a kind of dialogue. As a young man discovering music, he loved Gustav Holst's musical suite called The Planets and Camille Sanson's Carnival of the Animals, which inspired respectively his own Planets and Songs for Unusual Creatures projects. Some other interesting musical collaborations include The Recipe Project, in which Hearst and Camp invited notable chefs like Mario Batali, David Chang, and John Besh to provide recipes and creative direction, and then wrote original songs around the recipes. The lyrics consisted entirely of the recipes word for word, He's also scored movies, theater, and dance projects, and now he's working on Songs for Fearful Flyers, inspired partly by Brian Eno's music for airports and partly by a chance phone call he had with Whoopi Goldberg. I'm telling you, man, you can't make this stuff up. He says, I've always bitten off more than I can chew and gone after things full force. Here are a few observations before we move forward. He's curious. He's a curious guy. He's curious about curious things, and that curiosity creates new curiosities. He's on a kind of constant search for the next thing. And that leads me to my second observation, the importance of ideas. You can almost feel the weight of a good idea to Michael and the sense of obligation he feels to see a good idea to fruition, to deliver, to midwife an idea once he has it, whether it's specific to the music or to the marketing and presentation of the work, he has no problem taking matters into his own hands. And finally, humor. Specifically, a kind of absurdist humor seems to fuel his process, or at least lubricate it. He said to me, Even in music school, I had a hard time really taking it serious. I did pieces that were fun and entertaining to me. I don't know that anyone should take themselves so seriously. We're such minute specks of nothingness. Who gives a shit? I enjoy life and I want to have fun. And man, you can tell. I really had a hard time choosing a single piece of music to play before starting our conversation. He just has so much and it's diverse. It all reveals a very personal musical point of view, but each project is different and it kind of flexes a different musical muscle and creative muscle, and so it's hard to choose. But it's like eating at a great restaurant, you know? Uh, you really can't go wrong at a great restaurant with a great chef whether or not you choose the chicken or the lamb, fish or fowl. So I'm just going to make an executive choice here and select The Honey Badger from Michael Hurst's Songs for Unusual Creatures. Mm-hmm. 
Michael Hurst, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Leo. I've lived in the slope for nine years. And when I moved here, you already seemed like a f- real fixture, a Brooklyn <laughs> fixture. The coffee shop around the corner sells the CDs of only one artist. Right. And it's yeah. you. Yeah. So I was kind of excited to see that you are a transplant to Brooklyn as I am as well. I moved here in 2001, in the spring of 2001, and, uh, you know, which was kind of terrible timing based on uh, historic events that took place later that year. But... Uh, stuck it out and and have been here ever since and and originally i'm from virginia grew up in virginia beach went to college in richmond virginia at vcu and uh moved up here in 2001 because i was working with an off-broadway production a show called the pumpkin pie show and i was basically traveling up here every single weekend to do these performances in the east village and i had kind of always knew i had to move to new york at some point but was ultimately terrified of it because of things like airplanes crashing into buildings, you know, stuff like that. Which um, hadn't actually happened. It hadn't yet. happened yet, but I just, you know, it was like, that's why I was scared to move here because it's a, you know, just a scary place to live if you're from Virginia, you know, and, uh, or from Wisconsin perhaps. But that show and coming up that often allowed me to sort of fall in love with the city. What were you doing in, aside from being scared of living in New York, what were you doing <laughs> in Virginia before you moved here? Soon after I graduated from college, I bumped into an old friend from college, Joshua Camp. I knew Joshua was working at Honer, which is a German harmonica and accordion manufacturer. The factory is based in the Black Forest in the Schwarzwald of Germany, but they have their main warehouse distribution center, repair center is in near Richmond. And I needed a job out of music school. What do you do with a music degree? And, uh, Josh was working there as an accordion technician, and I saw him and asked if there were any other jobs available. What uh, had you hoped to do with a music degree? I hoped to compose music for films, but, you know, as you, you know as well as I do, you, it's, how do you get into that? You can't just, you know, hey, hold up your hand, I compose music for films. It's like it's, it's an adventure trying to get to that point. And honestly, that was, what, 15, 20 years ago, and I'm still holding my hand up through this process and, and doing that, but... Uh, people actually see my hand now, whereas they didn't see it when I lived in (laughs) Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. I had to go through kind of all these steps to get there. But Josh, yes, there was a harmonica technician position was available. (laughs) So I started working at Honer. Josh was the accordion tech. I was the harmonica tech. I actually repaired harmonicas eight hours a day, five days or four days a week, really. Honestly, I hated harmonica. Uh, It wasn't a sound or instrument I particularly liked. And I had to learn how to play it. And Did you learn to love it in playing it or not? No, I, I still kind of hate it, but I yeah. do love the history. I'm staring at your stack of harmonicas yeah, yeah, as I say this. Yeah. I see a blues harp and... Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. There You have the MS series blues harp. At Honer, they refer to that as more shit. Have I been taken advantage of? Not at all, but the, the MS series, the reed plates are interchangeable. You can actually buy the cheapest... MS series. There's a little secret for harmonica players. You can buy, uh, I think it's like the Big River Harp is maybe the cheapest MS series harmonica. They're the uh-huh. exact same reeds and reed plates. If you blow out a reed on a blues harp, just buy it and swap out the reed plates. Well, and that's the part that I really f- became fascinated with was almost more the history and the science and and I say technology, even though it's very simple, was an instrument invented by a clockmaker in the 1800s, but free reeds, um, which can be applied to so many other things too. And Honer has so bravely or foolishly invented all these instruments that use free reeds um, hmm. often that are on the market for a day and then removed. And, you know, obviously the harmonica has stuck and the harmonica is one of the top selling instruments in the world because it's affordable. You can put it in your pocket. Anybody can be a musician. And mm-hmm. that's why it's worked so well with uh, lower income people and become these amazing blues people, you know, right. and it's like, but uh, obviously an accordion is sort of a very elaborate harmonica. In fact, in German, uh, well, Mund harmonica is harmonica and an accordion is harmonica. Uh-huh. So uh, it's sort of the other way around. The harmonica is the mouth accordion, but then melodicas and, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, there's, you can look through some of these old catalogs and see these crazy things that look like typewriters that you put in your mouth and have these keys <laughs> you play. And, and then, of course, they, while I was there, they invented this thing called the claviola, mm-hmm. which uh, looks like sort of an accordion, but you have a mouthpiece that you blow into, kind of like a melodica, but it only it doesn't have bellows. It has one set of vertical keys, and then it has pipes that come off to the left, and 
is sort of freaky looking, like yeah. a wing almost to the left. And you got into playing that? Well, that was introduced. It never even really went on the market. They made about eight of them originally as prototypes. And Josh and I thought they were the most awesome and ridiculous things in the world and basically decided to start a band based on that instrument. And that's how One Ring Zero started in uh, 1997, essentially. Uh, we started the band using the claviola as this front piece, but then figured why not add every other whistle and bell and toy and knickknack we could possibly find um, and that's how I got into playing the theremin at the, that time I had knew about theremins and I bought one and started playing and adding theremin to this I had this old Thomas organ that my father bought when I was eight years old with a Wurlitzer speaker and that was in every song and mm-hmm. um, basically I was also working for the dance department at VCU at the time and I uh, was playing drums so I would add a lot of you know beats and stuff and yeah and a lot of our early music the first album was in fact stuff that was written for modern dancers even the first couple albums and my wife was <laughs> a dancer uh-huh. going, to, going adding all that she was in one of the classes but um what is the history of the name what does the name mean it's such a dumb story uh ultimately we were called return to zero because everything was being recorded on a task cam eight track in my basement studio and there's the RTZ button, and we hit it so many times. Like, oh, let's add another. I mean, we just add track. We the whole idea was to write and record a song from start to finish in one day, mm-hmm. just adding layers and layers of instruments. And RTZ, you know, someone would yell from the other room and roll back to the zero, add a melodica. RTZ roll back and add the bass. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, and when the album came out, Return to Zero, first album. This was before Google. It came to our attention that there was like three other bands called Return to Zero. <laughs> including ex-members of the band Boston, had a band called RTZ. So we desperately were trying to... I mean, this was a week before the album was supposed to be printed. And uh, we had another song that was called, like, One Ring Circus or something. And, like, let's just combine these, and no one else is going to be dumb enough to... Basically, we knew that no one else would name their band One Ring Zero. That's, it, that's was sa- the, it was a safe option. It was a safe bet. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've come with all kinds of lies to tell people when Such they ask. Like a guy who, you know, calls you on the phone and then hangs up after one ring is a one ring zero or, uh, you know, a clown that is in a circus that, uh, I don't know. I mean, you, obviously, you know where this is going. It's just, they're all bad stories. There's, there's no good. In fact, you should probably just delete all of this from the podcast. We'll see. We'll see <laughs> what we get after this. And, you know, you, don't, you can't evaluate it in the moment. You that's have to true. wait and see. While we were working at Honer, I opened my studio in my house in Richmond and was recording bands, other bands in Richmond, Virginia, and it also became almost like every band in Richmond came through. I mean, mostly not like big bands, but like every punk rock band and high school band, and 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 it was a lot of fun. And you would record them? I would record them. I had an analog, everything on 8-track reel-to-reel. I would just bounce, Beatles style, you know? And eventually I moved into, had a digital room in my house and studio. I owned a house. I was 27 years old and owned a house in Richmond, Virginia, you know, with four bedrooms and a yard and and a studio in the basement. And I think I I bought it for $70,000 and it was on the lake and on the river, I mean. And uh, it was a lot of fun, but we were starting to get all this work in, in New York. And so I had the studio. I was working at Honer. I also was offered a job as an accompanist at the VCU dance department. This was about five, six years after I graduated with a degree in music composition. And it seemed like a great idea to play music for 30 beautiful young dancers. And I did that for a year or so. Uh, Ended up quitting Honer because I had my studio and was working in the dance department. And I I got Josh a job as an accompanist also at the dance department. So we both were, he quit Honer also. We both started working at the dance department and he was gigging out more. And then we got this offer to do this off-Broadway production. We were doing it for about a year or so and Josh moved up to New York. Uh, And about eight months later, I moved. I had to wait for my uh, beautiful young dancing girlfriend to graduate from Mm -hmm. college before Mm -hmm. I moved up here. (laughs) Then One Ring Zero was officially in New York. When you talk about the kind of initial instruments that you were using in your band, the organ and the weird accordion. Claviola. Claviola, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, it seems like there's this kind of nostalgia in the music for a a time that may or may not have existed (laughs) before. But what were some of your musical influences or what was some of the music that was informing you? I love that you said for a time that may or may not have existed. I was just thinking, I was just telling my wife walking over here, I was like, oh, there's a new Star Wars coming out. And I was thinking about a long time ago in a galaxy far away, like this may or may not have existed a long time ago. Uh, And there is some uh, Star Wars influence. I always joke about the claviola looks like something from the cantina scene in Star Wars. You know, not so much musically, but aesthetically, there's this vibe of just kind of like, oh, 
here's a bunch of weirdos in suits playing these weird instruments and, you know, and some sci-fi things. And, but at the same time, Joshua and I were fascinated with, uh, Klezmer music in particular, the whole Klezmer revival had just taken place a few years earlier. And, you know, we, we, we watched a lot of these, uh, early documentaries and, and listened to some of these early albums. And I think it was a combo of our interest in Eastern European. We also were just, I've always loved sort of a circusy, uh, vibe for mm-hmm. lack of better words mm-hmm. as i look at your vibraphone mm-hmm. even as a child i was writing music that i would call like the animal song and it would be uh kind of a weird quirky waltz huh. with circusy chromatic melodies and and then as i got older discovering tom waits and and then hearing danny elfman and then realizing oh wait this is really just kurt vile and this mm-hmm. is nino rota and you know and putting all this together and and you take that and you add it to the weirdest instruments you can find and you get one ring zero. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, it became something that was also very project based. Each album was taking on a new, at first it was, yeah, it was just instrumental music using these weird instruments with this style sound, but with the literary scene, uh, and working with authors, it led to this concept of why don't we each album be more of a project themed thing. Yeah. Hearing the one ring zero story and, how it came from RTZ, you mentioned that you would set this kind of somewhat artificial limitation on yourself, like we're going to write a song in a day and whatever emerges in that day, that's the song that Mm -hmm. we wrote. That already is a kind of a superimposition of some limitation. And I was thinking about your projects today, how, you know, they're as informed by what they're not as what they are. You eliminate a lot of possibilities and what's left is the sort of nugget of truth at the center of it, you know, so whether or not it's animals or food or authors or the news, yeah. you know, all of these things are have stripped away a lot of op- yeah. opportunity, and so you really have a chance to, like, hone in on what it is. I love the way you've looked at that. I love to set limitations on, on my work. I love program music and um, have always been fascinated with, with the project, you know, and setting boundaries. I've been aware of this, and it, was, it wasn't necessarily something that I totally knew that's what I wanted to do, and it wasn't completely coherent you know i don't know like it was in the back of my head and i was just doing this without thinking about it but then i started working and this is jumping way ahead i started working with chronos quartet a bunch in the past few years and david harrington of chronos quartet was the one who kind of said to me and it made sense it's like because this is what chronos does too every album is a different project even though they're a string quartet they this one's going to be you know this style album this one's going to be whatever the african album this one's going to be a bollywood album and and i realized i was doing sort of a similar thing but under my name and or one ring zero's name and with these weird instruments and he was the one who basically said look you keep doing this and uh some of them are going to flop some are going to take off but ultimately what you're left with is this catalog that will just keep building and becomes you and it's no longer i am this guy who does this literary thing I am this guy who does this weird instrument thing. I'm this guy who does this recipe thing. I am this guy who does all these projects and finds things that are fascinating and interesting and goes after them and then moves on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. When you do it under the name One Ring Zero, how does the collaborative element of that work? How do you approach that? It's always been Josh and I as a duo. Uh, we've had lots of different musicians work with us in the past. Um, I mean, we had a six-piece band when we lived in Virginia, and when we moved to New York, we basically had to find new musicians and... Uh, and in New York, it seems like musicians come and go so quickly. It's difficult because everyone's professional and gigging and has to take a million gigs. Um, so it was never really an option to bring in other collaborators in the sense of the band. But the idea of collaborating with these other elements was has always been from project to project, whether it was with the authors or with a dance company or with a director or... Uh, with chefs, you know, whatever the case may be. So that was always an interesting thing was to uh, find those collaborations, especially with people who had never collaborated or knew music. It was often a very divorced collaboration in the sense of here's, you know, my contribution, now you take it and you do this. As far as Josh and I would, would work together, you know, a lot of times we get in the studio and say, okay, we need to start working on this piece. And, you know, one of us will hammer out some chords and be like, well, that's a starting point. And then, you know, then we'll say, well, how about if you add this sort of progression and maybe has a bass line like this? And because we want to include that lyrics as a, you know, repeating thing. And and our bra- and the longer we worked together, the more our brains sort of became one mm-hmm. and knew what the other was thinking. And 
Um, and so that picture at bar best of the two of us with one accordion kind of is true in some sense, yeah. you know. And, so then how does it feel when you are attacking a project alone? I mean, is it a, a different way of thinking about it when well, it's just you or not really? Yes and no. I mean, it's, at sometimes I, I, working on solo projects, I actually like I'm like what what would Josh say you know yeah. like in the studio if we were together like would he, you know I that runs through my head sometimes um and uh you know the reality of it is we both became busy with so many other things one ring zero has slowed down a lot in the last few years it's like I, I never want to say one ring zero is done because I feel like at any point Josh and I will let's work on this album or let's do these shows yeah um and there's just no point you know we're grown-ups and we're it's not like a high school band it's a collaborative yeah. project that I feel like is never ending but uh, in the meantime, while he's gotten busier doing stuff, I started releasing solo things, and my solo work got busier. <laughs> so yeah. it's kind of been tricky to, like, we need to find time to get together and work on stuff. Otherwise, you know, it's easy just to keep going down these paths. Sure. So when you moved from Virginia, you moved straight to Brooklyn. I moved straight to Park Slope. I uh, had a, the director of the play, Clay McLeod Chapman, who is also an actor and writer, uh, lived on 17th Street. And... Uh, my wife and I, who she wasn't my wife at the time, but we moved into his house and there was a room that he had for rent. And so we were there for three or four months and uh, we actually signed our lease uh, for September 1st of 2001. Wow. Uh, you know, a year lease. <laughs> and uh, two weeks later, I was trying to decide whether we wanted to break our lease or not. Um, but we, you know, we were here and stayed here and, uh, have lived on 11th street since then. And it's amazing how much it's changed. And yeah, it's in, as you're saying about, uh, the coffee shop and bar best, the okay. music venue, you know, as I got to meet people in the neighborhood who wanted to do these things, I jumped on it and was like, Hey, if you do this, I'll help you out. That's amazing. I can't think of anything better than having a music venue in the neighborhood. I'll help you build the place. And, and in fact, I built the stage at bar best and have uh, b been very good friends with Olivier and Vincent, the owners. And, mm -hmm. and then six years into that, uh, this coffee shop opens next door and I get to know Jonathan Israel, who's the owner and he's become one of my best friends. And, mm -hmm. And slowly I'm turning his coffee shop into a Michael Hurst uh, outlet store. That is the dream, I think, for all of us <laughs> to have a venue to sell your product in where they really only, you know, if you're going to make an impulse buy at the last minute, your options are a One Ring Zero CD <laughs> or a Michael Hurst book. Or some financiers. Jonathan is awesome. He's such a good guy. And, uh, and you know, I obviously love his product, too. And when he first opened up, I've always been interested in, in the food world and pastries, and, and I asked him if I could uh, work there one day a week just to learn how to make pastries. Can I come there and, and just hang out in the kitchen and, mm -hmm. and get away from music and writing and, you know, see how you do this stuff? And and he said, sure. Uh, and But the only position he had available was as a barista in the front. And I thought, well, that would be fun too. Why not? It was sort of a vanity job, I hate to say. I mean, it wasn't like great money or anything, but it was a lot of fun. And I was wired on coffee all day long and uh, got to know a lot of people in the neighborhood through that also. Of course, being close with Bar Best, which is next door, would all my friends would come in and before a gig and get a coffee. And, and then after work, go next door and get a drink with them and mm -hmm. play a show. And so it's kind of this nice uh, combo. You seem intensely curious about a lot of things. And despite the fact that that might have been a kind of a respite from music for you, I mean, ultimately, you managed to turn your interest in food, for example, into a kind of a musical <laughs> right, project. Yeah. And it seems like all of this kind of curiosity that you have ends up informing and feeding the, the art projects that you do. I feel like when I was in college and studying music, you know, it, it's very easy to say, I'm going to be this sort of composer or this sort of writer or artist. Really, I mean, the safest and best thing I feel like anybody can do is to work with what's in front of you and what you know best. Mm -hmm. um, and instead of trying to go after something that's not necessarily tangible, uh, to, you know, realize what you have right in front of your face. And when I first moved to Brooklyn, I stumbled into a little store on 7th Avenue, which uh, uh, happened to be owned by Dave Eggers, who was kind of a lesser-known writer at the time and was just starting this publication called McSweeney's, mm -hmm. um, and fell in love with the store. And he gave them some of our earliest CDs and uh, said, okay, well, let's work with writers. We got to know all these writers through McSweeney's. Uh-huh. So that's um, how that happened. I think 
his book had just come out and I was, this was heartbreaking work of staggering genius. And I was reading it as everyone was in 2001. Mm -hmm. And someone said, you know, Dave Eggers owns a store in the neighborhood. I'm like, here in Park Slope? You're kidding, where? And he he used to live here on 9th Street, right next to Barbess and Colson. He moved to San Francisco that year or the year before, but not before he started McSweeney's and opened and started renting this little space, which was his office and was sort of a curio of mm-hmm. random oddities, plus the first few issues of McSweeney's. And I must have walked up and down 7th Avenue 30 times trying to figure out which store it was because there was no sign. I'm like, well, it's not this vacuum store <laughs> with the twins. It's not, uh, you know, this uh, barber shop with this 90-year-old Italian barber. You know, it's mm-hmm. like it must be this place with these gigantic pots with uh, pumpkins growing out of them. And uh, and went in there, and it was like, what is this stuff? There are pewter bird's feet in little cubby holes, and small rubber cubes were for sale. You could buy like three for a dollar. Um, springs in a jar. And, you know, and then this guy comes, uh, there's a, a counter with a cash register, but it's 10 feet off the ground. And this guy comes over looming down at me and is like, can I help you? And, uh, I was like, is this Dave Eggers store? And he's like, what, 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 and who, what? no, no, uh, this is, uh, this is place is just called store, you know, like kind of, it was very suspicious. Um, Unbelievable. And I knew I'd found the place. And yeah, so I gave them, we had, I guess, two albums out at the time and gave them a couple of the albums and. And I basically went home to tell Clay, who I was living with, I found the McSweeney store. I found it. I found it. And he came back. I brought him back with me to check it out and meet this guy who I'd met named Scott. And there, when I walked in, they were playing the album. And he was like, this stuff's great. And he had completely changed from this elusive <laughs> guy 10 feet above the ground to, uh, you know, hey, would you guys be willing to play our some of our readings? We have literary events every Tuesday night and would love it if you guys would play in between each reading just to kind of make the evening more interesting and and so yeah we did that for two years and got to know all these incredible writers and we were pretty much an entirely instrumental band um and huh. at, at some point we decided to ask them to write lyrics for us so yeah then one ring zero was officially in new york um and that was the same year that i met olivier walking down the street who is the owner of barbess he would listen to us play at mick sweeney's uh-huh. that was kind of the beginning of that whole Scene. Scene was Olivier said at some point to me that he was thinking about opening a venue in Brooklyn, in Park Slope. And I said, man, if you open a venue, let me know whatever I can do. Yeah. Um, And so if you go into Barbess, there's that painting that's in the back room of Josh and I as Siamese twins playing one accordion. That's from an early pumpkin pie show. That was a tapestry that was for the production. He said, can we hang that in this new bar? You know, that sort of thing. And yeah, we were one of the first... Bands to play at Barbest. There was basically five house bands at the time. It was, you know, like One Ring Zero, Hazmat Modine, Slavic Soul Party, Bebe Eiffel, which was Olivier's band at the time. And I think Las Rubias del Norte started mm-hmm. up around then, too. And and it was kind of a tight, incestuous little park slope scene we created. And, yeah. and it was a blast. I mean, it's it's like a, it's kind of the dream scenario. Totally. And I think that kind of sets the stage for exactly what I walked into when I moved here. I don't know. I couldn't quite figure out how long it had been there. It hadn't been there that well, long. It looks, yeah, it looks so vintage. It was just kind of like I had to unravel the mystery around what was happening there. And it was also kind of seductive and interesting to me. Well, and Olivier has such an amazing sense and ability to curate. And he's always been into the world music scene. And, and, um, and not that One Ring Zero was particularly world music, but there were some, definitely lots of flavors of world going on in there, especially Eastern European. And yeah. I don't know if it was like officially on the website or if it was somehow known or if he said to me that there was this by eliminating two broad strokes of music, you eliminated 90 percent of what right. would normally like if you weren't playing straight ahead jazz and you weren't a singer song. Right. A yeah, singer songwriter was a big joke for a while. But it was great because it immediately it just eliminated sure. the majority of what people a are trying huge, to book. Huge. Yeah. I mean, that is like 75 percent of what everyone's trying to do. You mentioned the Kronos Quartet. I saw that some of the videos that you produced as part of the um, Unusual Creatures project. And there's the video with the Kronos Quartet. Sea Pig, yeah. That video was a great example of taking music that might be considered to be like really elevated and serious and really infusing it with an absurdist sense of humor. I mean, you at one point, 
they're kind of bowing these inflatable latex gloves yeah. and really bringing back down to earth a lot of the the kind of mystery of, of classical music and serious music. Right. You know, looking at your whole overarching thing. There's always a, a little bit of humor. Even when I was in music school uh, for my senior recital for music composition, I had a hard time really taking it serious. I mean, I, I learned everything I needed to learn, I feel like, for the most part. I you know, learned my notation and studied uh, Schoenberg and, his, you know, whatever. And, uh, but then when it came to composing, I did pieces that were fun and entertaining to me. I did a, uh, a uh, madrigal suite for uh, grocery stores where the you know singers listed I went to every yellow pages in every major town and listed every grocery store and had them just you know it was like that to me was just fun and interesting to take random words and has always been but uh, and I had three jurors and uh, two jurors gave me an A and the third juror gave me a D minus and he pulled me aside a few days later and just said you know you just aren't taking this seriously you, your sense of humor it's i don't you know you're in college and you should and i get that i appreciate that you know i'm spending money and i should be learning but it's like it, at the same time what was i doing that wasn't intended for the curriculum i did i nailed everything i used these arrangements of instruments uh, in varied forms i did the string quartet i did the brass quintet i did the piano i did you know but it felt maybe like you were laughing at i it. was mo- yeah i was but i wasn't laughing at them i was laughing at us at the world at everything i mean i just don't know that anybody should take themselves so so we are such this, this is getting deep and ridiculous but like we're such minute little specks of nothingness who gives a shit you know it's like i i enjoy life and i want to keep it that way and the minute i feel like you become so incredibly serious about your work or anything it's not fun and i want to have fun mm-hmm. you know and, um and i'm sure you, you can have fun and be serious too obviously but uh that's just how i operate i guess I don't yeah know. maybe it does lead to really looking at the first project that you did in new york which was with the authors mm-hmm. because there's a lot of humor in yeah, that yeah. project as well yeah when you connected with these authors and these writers to do the project, what would you talk about before you started writing? Or how would you approach writing songs with different writers? It was an interesting process because a lot of the authors did not know anything about music, how to play music. I mean, Jonathan Ames confessed that he owned one album, a Cat Stevens album, and that's all he knew. He didn't know anything about, you know. And so trying to get him to write lyrics was a little bit like, hey, Jonathan, have, can you, he's like, I don't know how to write lyrics, but here's a paragraph from something I wrote. I'm like, those aren't really, I mean, we could make that into a song, but can you at least have one sentence that repeats? And that's what happened. I mean, his song, The Story of the Harry Call, is this whole uh, song about how he had a, testicle that hadn't descended properly as a child and he made this voice to call out to his friends and on the playground and and it was and nothing rhymes and it was just random words except for the chorus uh i'm a trumpet and a wall this is the story of the harry call and then other writers like rick moody he is a musician uh not he wasn't so much at the time and he has become now he, you know it's like i as it was somewhat of a result of the project? I, I think? think so, yeah. I mean, in general, he just started working with One Ring Zero, and we started dragging him on stage with us all the time, and he'd be very shy and kind of, guys, I'm not good enough. I'm like, yeah, you are. Come on. And he'd play and strum along and sing along, and, and now he's leading his own band. And, and you know, they, they've done quite well, the Wingdale Community Singers. It ran from both those – there are people in between, Myla Goldberg actually knows how to play flute but and has her own band now too uh you know jonathan letham has written about music a lot and so it's different for different people i think working with paul oster was one of the most interesting aspects of that because he loves music but had never really done a lot of lyric writing i think he'd written some poetry here and there and but you know and we gave him this song and, and he just it like blew his mind and he's like let's do more you know and he huh. invited us over and he's like here's another set of lyrics and here's another and and here's my daughter she can sing too and well i was going to ask you i know that his daughter is now a kind of established singer sophie yeah i don't know how old she was she at was the time. 16 15 when we first started working with her at a really influential formative time in her her yeah i think it was um in many ways i feel like we were almost with all due respect to paul and siri i feel like a little bit like we were like almost like a hired like help take my daughter under your wing and uh you know, he's like, you guys are cool, are doing cool stuff. We want our daughter to be part of this. And and so for us, it was a little bit like, yeah, oh, she's sweet. We love her and we love Paul and Siri. Um, it's a little bit weird, but let's try this and see what happens. And 
um, you know, and so we ended up recording a lot of songs and with her and, and letting her put out her own album. And, you know, originally it was, they wanted to be called one ring zero with Sophie Oster. And we were like, let's just call it Sophie Oster, you know, and that sort of thing. And, and there's still some stuff on that album that I think is pretty cool. I'm, um, proud of Le Pont Mirabeau, which is a song about uh, a French famous French poem that we set to music and Sophie sings and hmm. a few cool things on there. But, um, but for the most part, I think we've all, including Sophie, have kind of swept that one under the rug uh-huh. a little bit. When you were working with the writers, you would give them a piece, a finished piece of music? Most of the time, they would give us lyrics, and we would write music to the lyrics, and then say, here's a song we wrote with your lyrics. What do you think? And most of the time, they would love it. Occasionally, they'd say, oh, I don't, yeah, not my style. And we'd ch- write a new song. I mean, some of those songs on that album have two or three versions that never got released with the wow. same lyrics. The only person that we did not work that way with was Rick Moody. And Rick we actually had songs and said, hey, we've written these songs and here's um, you know, a scratch vocal line that was just played on a piano. You want to write lyrics that fit that? And, and that was the one person who we were able to do that. All these different angles to work are fun. I would get bored if any one of them was, became uh, a formula that I stuck with. And it is the excitement of varying it up that gives you different results and makes things more interesting. How was that project received? I mean, honestly, it was what kind of put us on the map for whatever weird map we were on. Um, I mean, you know, we were selling, you know, a thousand, two thousand albums before that. We had three albums that came before that. And then As Smart As We Are came out and was released as a book CD combo by Soft Skull Press. You know, I think it was like 27,000 copies of that sold, which, you know, isn't a lot in the scheme of things. And it was right on the edge of when people stopped buying CDs too. But Mm -hmm. for us, that was huge. And it allowed us, we were getting offered to play at festivals all over the world. And I mean, and not just music festivals, at literary festivals and all these different, you know, and it was great. I mean, we were going to Spain and hanging out with Wol Soyenka and to Taiwan to play at rock festival, you know, and all kinds of fun things. So, yeah, I mean, again, that was really kind of like our business card or calling card. And, you know, and then it was a little tricky of, like, what do we do next? That was, And so what did you follow that up with? You know, we did a 180. We, we were like, we can ask more writers and do a follow-up, and maybe that would be the thing that would really put us into a bigger spot. But at the same time, I felt like there was this backlash going on against McSweeney's, and, and it just didn't feel true to do that. It didn't feel like – I felt like we were done with that, you know, and it was a lot of fun, but let's do something else. And, and at that point, I thought I would try something that – we had never done before, and that was to release an album simply for the sake of the music. <laughs> you know, like, we are going to write songs, write our own lyrics. It'll be in our style, but it's not going to be a collaboration with anybody, and it's going to be an indie rock album. It was called Wake Them Up, and it's still one of my favorite albums. It did not wake too many people up, but uh, it has actually been an album that a lot of the tunes have been licensed, which has been great. I was going to say, when you go to Spotify, some yeah. of them are the most popular yeah. songs. Are well, from so that it's record. like you never quite know where, I mean, and that's something that I have learned, and you know, I'm sure you know, are on this boat too, but it's like no one's buying records anymore, so you have to think what is going to be licensable. A&R, the sort of the arm of the record business that used to find the artists and help develop them, and they would also think about, well, what's going to be radio friendly? The role today is where's the 30 seconds of this? Totally. So rather than where's the radio single, it's where's the licensable moment on the sure. record. It's a twofold operation. Like you want to have this thing that you can release and be proud of, but you want to build your catalog of tunes that can be on hold for when, uh, you know. You get the call. Yeah, exactly. We're looking for a song that's about two minutes long that has a slight. De- yeah. So, yeah, and that's what uh, Wake Them Up was largely. It was lyric driven, at least half of the album, but it was largely instrumental. And, and that was kind of the one moment where we dipped our toes in just doing an indie rock straight ahead album for me and i and i learned from that that it's very hard to sell an album for music's sake music hmm. for music's sake it's, well you know it's funny you sold twenty seven thousand copies or whatever it was of smart smart as we are yeah. the author cd but you managed to bypass the record business yeah. actually you did it through a publishing company a book publishing <laughs> right, company totally which is great i mean it's a sort of like a, a larger example of being the only artist that is for sale at a coffee shop you know you're not competing with every other CD in the world, you are, yes, competing with every other book in the world, yeah. but there are not that many books and CDs that are combined sure. and sold that way. So you actually managed to get away with ha- without having to get signed to a record label. Well, and that's, no, one, no one wanted to sign us because we were so off the beaten path and, you know... Off the radar. Off the radar mm-hmm. that I had to think outside of the box to figure out how to get this stuff out there. And I remember it was, it was uh, Boo Frobel, Frobel, who books at 
at the time she booked at Galapagos and now she's the head booker for Lincoln Center Outdoors. Uh-huh. I was like, yeah, I keep trying to find some like back door way to get into the music industry and sell our stuff. And she's like, dude, you're doing it. <laughs> you know, you're getting your stuff is selling better than any musicians doing anything similar. And that's because you're not, you know, and, and even when I put out uh, songs for ice cream trucks, my first instinct was forget Koch and all these distributors. Let's talk to Baskin Robbins and try to get this on the counter at every ice cream shop around Brilliant. the country, you know, and and. Um, uh, well, two things happened. One was I could not get bar none to make it happen. So I took into my own hands and got in touch with the vice president of Baskin Robbins, talked to him, sent him the stuff. Um, he never re- got back to me after I sent him the stuff and I pissed off bar none records by doing oh, that. <laughs> you made a, a record sort of inspired by and dedicated to ice cream trucks. Right. So songs for ice cream trucks, uh, I think I was working on a One Ring Zero album at the time and, and was just getting fed up by hearing the Mr. Softy truck pass by my apartment every two hours. And you can hear it very, if you listen very carefully on some One Ring Zero records in the background of every other song. I was like, man, someone needs to write some new tunes for these ice cream trucks. And then it occurred to me that, that someone was going to have to be me or you. You could have done it too. But uh, You have to take matters into your own hands yes, sometimes. Yes. Um, I went about writing, uh, you know, it's a 40 minute album of ice cream truck songs that I self released under my name. And, and I wasn't even necessarily thinking that they were going to get used by the truck as more the novelty of doing this album of chimey songs that wasn't that far from what I normally did anyway. It's just a lot more glockenspiel. And what are the elements? I mean, the main thing I used was the main melodies are glockenspiel. That was the one thing that I could really play music on that would sound ice cream trucky i mean if i really were going to do it right i would get a music box and carve out reeds myself and i thought about even like doing some of that but it was just going to be too complicated and yeah. i wanted to take it a step further and and the reality is you know that's looking at uh historic ice cream trucks that's looking at how these old nickels boxes are called from uh these early trucks and even before that there were music boxes essentially with a spindle and you know we're in a new era you can hook up an ipod to speakers and that's what a lot of the newer ice cream trucks are playing so why limit myself with a music box so did you do a little research i did a lot of research um i talked to historians i read books i talked to ice cream truck drivers the one thing that i really learned was that the idea of the music is it's supposed to call attention to the truck it needs to be something that can project through the air and can be heard a few blocks away hence the high-pitched yeah. glockenspiels and they're, they're little speakers on the truck and um i also learned that it wasn't just us who are sick of the ice cream truck songs the drivers were incredibly sick sure. of the songs and were eager for new material so so has it been used by yeah i mean ice that's cream you know and again it's like i didn't even think that would happen but the album came out and it got fairly good press just because of, again, I was saying it's hard to sell music for music's sake, but if you have a angle to it and you can spin it into something, here it is. You know, everyone wants to write about, come springtime every year, every, you know, I get calls saying, hey, would you be on this show about ice cream truck music? And huh. you know, I mean, the album came out six years ago, and it's like I'm still doing press for it. Hmm. But uh, And a couple things happened. One was that it sort of became a runaway kids record. All these parents were saying, oh, my God, my kid loves this, like, lullabies, nursery rhyme, yeah. you know. Then I started getting emails from ice cream truck drivers and still have continued to get emails and calls, you know, saying, can I order this and how can I attach it to my truck and this and that. And so there's, you know, 50 plus trucks around the country, at least that I know of that are using it. Um, I know there's like an entire fleet in Portland that's using some of the tunes and, and it's also been licensed. I mean, one of the tunes was in a Wendy's commercial. Another one was in Bored to Death. You know, it's like all that stuff has... I mean, it's funny because when you see, I see the title songs, Songs for Ice Cream Trucks. Is that yeah. what it's called? Yeah, that's, how, that's as simple and as how else would you, you know. Like. Right, but, but it didn't occur to me that it was that an ice cream truck driver would read that and go, oh, this is, this is for my ice cream truck. I thought it was de- more like dedicated to it ice cream It was originally. Yeah, it was more of a dedication thing. But the, what I realized also was that if you, at the time, if you Googled ice cream truck music, ice cream truck songs, songs for ice cream trucks, music, right, nothing was coming up. I mean, hmm. you'd find a link to the Nichols company that sold that music box that plays the song that you hear every second on yeah. the street. So, yeah, I should call this thing Songs for Ice Cream Trucks. Um, and uh, and now when you Google that, <laughs> that's, you go straight to my site. Following that, you got to the food project, although I think there are some other projects in between. Right. Re- uh, there was Planets. Did a whole uh, song cycle of music inspired by the planets basically we realized it had been a hundred years since gustav holst had released his orchestral suite and thought it'd be fun to essentially revisit with our own music our own instruments our own style 
And, so did you look at that initial suite? And, oh, yeah. We listened to it a lot. And in fact, that was you know something I loved and listened to a lot when I was younger and kind of was one of those things that I could grab onto and put the Led Zeppelin aside. And this is cool. You know, this song about Mars and Bringer of War and um, maybe I'll go to music school. You know, and so we there's some nods to Holst in our version. And we looked at w- how science has changed from then. And, and Holst's version starts at Earth and expands its way out. We start at the sun and work our way out. Holst did not include Pluto because Pluto had not been discovered yet, which was a smart move because then Pluto ultimately was demoted to not being a planet. And by the time you did planets, had Pluto not been demoted? It had been demoted, and that was sort of the inspiration in some ways to start the album. And we decided we're going to keep it because we love Pluto and you know forget that it's no longer a planet. And it also allowed us to get this uh, amazing quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson that says was listening to Planets by One Ring Zero until a song titled Pluto came on. What's up with that? (laughs) And so we just made a sticker for the album, and that was it. And the song is, in fact, about Pluto's demotion and how that took place. It's a lyric song. It's funny because I probably became most aware of Pluto's demotion by way of our mutual friend Claire and the Reasons record. Oh, yeah. And their song Pluto is also kind of about that. Yes, we were working on those at the exact same time. And in fact, Claire and I got together and said, hey, you're doing a song about Pluto. So are we. We should pitch this to NPR and do it. And we did. You know, and I was like, we're both deviously like, how do we? Fantastic. So we did a show together where uh, we both discussed our love of Pluto. Um, and her song is so beautiful. I love the strings and ahs together in that song. Incredible. And the other thing we put on the album was one song for all of the exoplanets that had been discovered, which uh, Holst did not know about all uh-huh. these other planets outside of our solar system. Right. And, and they keep discovering more, and it could be an endless suite of material that comes out for each planet, but we figured we'd just do one track to cover them all. Right. Or in the sheet music, it should just have a repeat sign. Yeah, you know, like Philip so Glass, it, yeah. Gone Wild. Yeah. It's, it can accommodate the future. You don't know a, what's going to happen. The new album, Philip Glass, Gone Wild. <laughs> Planets came out, and then uh, we kind of went back to the author project idea, but this time working with chefs and asked all these different chefs for recipes that we would then set to music in, in a style of music that they suggested and sing word for word, which was incredibly difficult to do take a recipe set it to music and sing it word for word in the style suggested by the chef is yeah. a lot and uh it was a big challenge and so if it's a tarantella you have to do a tarantella and that's sense. exactly what happened yeah i mean vitale you know said tarantella here's a tarantella uh, aaron sanchez said banda and we're like oh man so yeah we wrote a big banda piece for him for this dolce de leche duck breast with ancho chilies and we had a uh zydeco song for john besh I mean, that was easy enough because Josh plays accordion. I just had to buy a Zydeco triangle and keep rhythm on it. Do you have a relationship with these chefs already? No. This was even more divorced than the whole author thing. I mean, the authors we knew. We got to know all of them. We worked with them. We became friends with them. I'm still friends with those authors and, you know, still talk to them regularly and brought them on stage with the chefs. It was uh, much more email through, sometimes with them personally. I got to know some of them. Um well, one of them, Chris Cosentino, is my brother-in-law, so that, uh-huh. I definitely know him, um, and he was very helpful in, in introducing me to a lot of the others as well. You know, a lot of it was through agents and yeah, uh, yeah, and emails and and even Twitter. You know, like, hey, dude, send me a recipe. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. My mother has this line that I love, which is, food is the new rock and roll. What it felt like in the 60s to see how the world started looking at music, that's how it feels now, seeing the shift in, in the way chefs are perceived in the popular cultural conversation. No, that's, and that's true. In the album, in the book, is a book-album combo again. We wrote about that, and, and that was true with the author project, too. At the time, all these authors were becoming rock stars. It was like this resurge of sort of the beatnik era or something in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, where all these authors were becoming huge. People were reading again and going to literary events, and and all these authors secretly wanted to be rock stars, and so why not make them rock stars? Mm-hmm. And now here we are, you know, eight years later, all these chefs are rock stars. They are the new rock stars, you know, thanks to the Food Network and all these magazines and, and shows. It's like, yeah, people people know who... John Besh and Mario Batali and David Chang are way before they know who's in the top 20 music world. But that's why I think it's kind of not surprising, but kind of funny that it was a different time, let's say, but you were able to approach 
the authors directly and personally. But when it came time to meet the chefs, the way to do it was through an agent or through Twitter, the yeah. same way you would try to find like a famous actor or a, exactly, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I have to say it wasn't nearly as much fun and didn't yeah. feel as organic because of that. I mean, that was maybe one spot. I mean, the, the organic factor did come in with my brother-in-law and that was a big part of it. And Chris is, you know, a celebrity chef at this point. He's had several shows on the Food Network mm-hmm. and stuff. And is in, every time I open a food magazine, oh, there's my brother-in-law. You know, and he was the one who was like, oh, you should do an album like your author thing, but with chefs. And, oh. and so he was the one who really kind of was pushing the idea. And at some point, it just, yeah, let's try this. And I wrote, we did, the first song we did was for him. Um, it was sort of a Beastie Boys, white boy hip hop song for him, which is what he loves. And, and uh, I think I asked maybe one or two other friends who are chefs, because it was just, it was tough. These guys were so busy. I mean, authors sit at home all day writing, and if you send them an email, they're going to respond. Yeah. And you can get in touch with most authors. Chefs, you know, not so much. So it was, it was like, and I do feel like chefs in particular really only communicate through Twitter. A lot of them, it's crazy. Huh. Maybe Twitter is just like the most immediately fast. That's like, exactly it. I mean, if you own four restaurants and you're traveling from one to another every day and occasionally actually cooking or you know, yeah. picking up the produce or whatever, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, all you have time for is to write at Michael Hurst. Sure. Agent is sending you recipe right. now. You have permission. Right. You know? I started to talk to Emma Straub about that a little bit yeah. when we spoke about just how blown away I am by how available she is, not only to her friends, but to her yeah. fans. And sure. like. And That's why she's been so successful. Emma doesn't turn anything down. Completely. She, and yeah. she's prolific. I mean, she's also writing. But the truth is that I think if you manage your time well as a writer, you can actually get a lot done. Yeah, you just have to uh, delegate certain hours. I mean, and she has a child, which is also yeah. difficult. But like to – these are my hours for writing. These are my hours for doing social media. These are my hours for hanging out with my child. You know, I find myself doing that as well. And you have to. There's no other way. So how is your general workflow set up? I mean, it's it's changed drastically because I have a six-month-old, and I'm still trying to figure out how to make it all happen with, uh, you know, I keep saying, like, oh, my biggest project that I'm working on right now is this child, and this project is not one that I turn in and move on to the next one. This ch- right. this project doesn't go away. Keeps going, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so it's like that just becomes part of everything. And I had, you know, my studio was in my apartment. We have a one-and-a-half-bedroom apartment, and that half-bedroom was my studio, which is now my son's bedroom. And that's where you would record these records? It's moved. A lot of them, yes. A lot of them were recorded there. I mean, we jumped all over the place. For a while, we were in Clay McLeod Chapman's basement on 17th Street, which is where we did all of As Smart As We Are on an 8-track. Actually, it was a 7-track. One of the tracks broke. It says in the album, recorded on a 7-track, <laughs> real to real. And then the next Wake Them Up was recorded in Oscar Noriega's basement. Oscar, who's a jazz guy, but also a bar best guy bought a house in the neighborhood and he let us use his basement to record an album. Wow. The Raspberry Project was recorded entirely in my apartment. Planets was recorded basically in my apartment or Josh's apartment, with the exception of once in a while we need to record a piano or something, which I don't have, and we'll go to Barbess and use their piano and just put a mic on it. Or, right. Um, yeah, we just bring in outside musicians. and So that's how that's gone, and that's kind of such a New York and the way everyone's working in general now with limited space and you can buy your own equipment and so now i have a studio which i share with uh, actually the editor for the unusual creatures pbs series he's my office mate you know it's it's a matter of finding those hours you know my wife is a freelance yoga instructor so we're both essentially a lot of times i work around her schedule i right. find out her schedule and then i say okay well i'm going to take these hours to go and actually try to jam on this project and it's it's tough i mean it's i I have about half the amount of time, and I have feel like I have twice the amount of work right now. The Unusual Creatures feels like a project that in some ways is inspired by fatherhood. I think it is mostly inspired by my lack of growing up in my own childhood, uh, which obviously I'm happy to pass on to my son. But uh, just as Hulse Planets was a big inspiration, so was Camille Sanson's Carnival of the Animals. I loved that, Another, again, an orchestral suite. And that was one of the things that going into music school, I want to write music like this, program music, and pick interesting things to write about. And and in his orchestral street, of course, all the compositions are inspired by usual animals, mm-hmm. <laughs> donkeys and uh, swans and turtles. So it just seemed like, well, why don't I use my weirdest musical instruments and write songs about the weirdest animals on the planet? And that's where that came from, and that was a good two or three years before I... Uh, had huh. a child the album came out first you know but it was certainly intended to be somewhat of a 
children's thing, but an interesting children's album. There's no lyrics. You know, as I always say, with all due respect to the There May Be Giants and Dan Zanes, it's like I wanted to do something that I listened to when I was a kid, which was Peter and the Wolf and Carnival of the Animals and uh, stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, when that album came out, I sort of simultaneously was offered to do a book through Chronicle, a children's book, which, again, is a book not necessarily meant to be written for kids, but it's a kid's book. And it's 50 of my favorite weird animals that I each each page is a different weird animal that I write about. And kind of it's almost like done in those old uh, safari card style, like Mm -hmm. here's the map and here's its scientific information. And then here's my goofy paragraph that I write in my own voice about this weird creature and why it's so awesome. And it goes together with the CD. You can listen to the CD. And the bottom line was the publisher didn't want to put out a CD. They're like, CDs are done. We can put a code that goes to download. download. Or, yeah. Like, yeah, that's no, I'll release the album myself, uh-huh. which was kind of a win-win because then I could retain rights and right. continue to release my own stuff. And, and here's the book. And, and that opened the door to why don't I just make this an empire of unusual creatures? I'll buy the URL for unusualcreatures.com and, you know, we'll make stuffed animals and do videos. And that's then PBS came on board and said, let's do a video series. I mean, it's funny, that idea of the old safari cards, again, almost kind of has like a Wes Anderson-y nostalgia, you know, for something that feels like something that we remember from our childhood. Well, did you see the most recent, the Wes Anderson uh, Moonrise Kingdom? Kingdom, yeah. I thought it was amazing. I mean, this was, uh, you know, my album had come out, the book had come out, and this opening scene where they're in the house and the kids are all listening to Carnival of the Animals, Benjamin Britten, and and I was like, no way, he nailed it, you know, and like, and that was exactly sort of my childhood, and it is a nostalgia that I've grabbed. I still have that plastic box that you flip open that has all the safari cards in it, and when I went to the designers for my book, I said, I want it to look like this, you know? And it's great because it's like it. people have forgotten that, and it was so cool. And, and everything can come around and sort of you pick the – you're able to pick through what was the coolest of the cool back then and revamp it for a new generation in some ways. Film music makes a lot of sense for you professionally. By talking about Nino Rota and uh, Kurt Weill. Danny Elfman. Danny Elfman. Yeah. Obviously, as you were developing – film music became a reality for you became aware of it yeah i think of it for all of us as kind of the holy grail of instrumental music in a popular context yeah when you saw that wes anderson movie i mean there's got to be part of you that's thinking like i gotta get in touch with this guy like (laughs) he's got to be made aware of what i'm doing yeah i mean i would have to take out mark mother's ball first but uh and now uh alexander displot has been yeah no i mean he's got great taste and and i have been in touch with wes anderson in the past i've emailed him and i would love to work with him uh I mean, you know, same with Tim Burton and all these guys, but they all have sort of, it's like, I feel like a lot of directors and I respect that they find their composer and they work tightly together. And and every person you ask Carter Burwell, like, well, how do you get into this? Like you, you you become friends with these guys in college and you stick with them, you know, and, and that's how it happens. And, uh, you know, unfortunately I kind of missed that boat. I wasn't, I didn't go to NYU and work with no film majors that I thought were great. So I'm fending for myself at this point and constantly trying to just meet directors and 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 the more films you do and the more commercial work you do the more the word gets out as you know and it's just kind of like one of those things where yeah i mean i i've always known and wanted to do this as i mentioned earlier and my music definitely lends itself to that it's sort of a no-brainer but it's still trying to find these people who were willing to work with you and not their buddy from the dorms as you created these opportunities to put your music out there and i think in a lot of ways these projects sound like they were kind of a way for you to kind of put more music of yours out there so that it's available for anybody who's looking to see what you can do. Here's another calling card that you've managed to sneak in the back door of all of these projects because they all stand alone as these beautiful art pieces that don't expire. They don't, it doesn't matter if they came out last year, eight years ago or 12 years ago, because they stand alone as their own thing. And yeah, I mean, my advice to anybody doing that, it's like, I I feel like at this point, you know, we're not going to make money from selling music online. It's just not going to happen. It's so depressing. Pandora and YouTube and, you know, the checks that come in and, you know, you can post your bill on Facebook. Oh, look, I made three cents for a thousand downloads. And yeah. it doesn't matter. Just put it out there because, you know, the more it's out there, the more someone with money will come to you and yeah. you know, who does have to pay for what they're doing. And, you know, and so it's kind of like, yeah, put it on every digital platform you can possibly sure. find why not uh, you can't get paid anymore but you can also make records in your 
half a bedroom. Yeah, which still takes time and costs money, and you got to buy the software, and, and and you have to take the time. You have to spend the exactly. Time. No, it's it's time and the skill. You don't. It's not something anybody can just sit down and you know. I, th- I think it was like David Gilmore was saying in some old Pink Floyd thing. It's like, look, yeah, not everybody knows how to use this equipment, and that's we're not leaning on the equipment. We have to know how to use the equipment and what to do with it. Yeah. So how? What are you thinking about now? Uh, well, I'm finishing up uh, a new album, Songs for Fearful Flyers. Um, I do not like to fly. I've never liked to fly. I fly nonstop because of what I do, um, and I tolerate it, but I hate it, and it just keeps getting worse, you know, like, you know, with the more TSA and <laughs> this and that. And, and at some point, someone told me that the only album they could listen to while flying was Songs for Ice Cream Trucks, and that was like win like awesome you know another yeah. another weird thing and i realized i listen to chopin nocturnes over and over again uh i also have listened i listened a lot to uh glass's version of the heroes album by david bowie for some reason i really mm-hmm. like that which is brian Eno also worked on and then i was talking about brian Eno's music for airports and all these things and it's like you know i'm gonna do an album that's um well here's here's the real name droppy fun part of the story is that i was in san francisco right working on a play right when that Air France jet disappeared into the Atlantic Ocean. I was like, oh, no, and i got to fly to France on Air France in a few days. And mm. obviously the odds are – I know the odds. I know the statistics. And, uh, and I Especially told, on Air France. That's, it's not going to happen twice on yeah, Air France in a week. No, exactly. And I told the director, Ellen Sebastian Chang, I told her, I was like, oh, flight, oh, no, I'm terrified. Listen to that. And Ellen, who's been working in theater for a long time, said, you need to talk to my friend Whoopi. And she literally like calls up Whoopi and hands the phone to me. I'm like, I think I know which Whoopi this is. Yeah. And I get the phone and, hi, Michael. I'm like, hi, Whoopi, how are you? She's like, I understand you're afraid of flying. So am I. You know, and, and we have this whole conversation while people are coming in and taking their seats. And, and she's like, here's what you need to do. And she's telling me all this stuff. And by the end of the conversation, I felt better. And I said, if I can get you to record what you just told me, and I can use it behind some music, I will put out an album called Songs for Fearful Flyers. Would you be willing to... And she's like, I, I will do that. So the final song on the album is Whoopi doing um, voiceover work for, you know, Incredible. Fearful Flyers. So that's what I'm working on, and another book, and a baby, and yeah. You've done so much wordless music, and yet there's another component in your life, which is, as a writer, to write yeah. words. Yeah. Why do you think the separation... Well, I don't always separate them. I like to put them together, but um, there is a big difference, and that's something I learned through the author project, As Smart As We Are, was that there's a big difference between prose writing and lyric writing. Lyric writing is essentially poetry, and it's coming up with an artistic, clever, interesting way to say something that can be interpreted in any number mm-hmm. of ways, whereas prose writing is very much, typically at least... Um, trying to get a point across in as clear and straightforward a manner as possible. Yeah. And with music, I don't feel like I necessarily have that opportunity. Music is much more abstract. Even the most uh, deliberate compositions is still abstract compared to writing, at least in my mind. And I'm sort of making this up as I go along, and it sounds really good. But, sounds uh, great. Yeah, I'm, with, I'm buying it. Uh, and it was around that time that I also... I've always liked to write, but that really getting to know these writers was inspiring. And I thought, I'm going to try to write a book. If these guys can do it and they're <laughs> my friends, I can do it too. And, and you know, I've, I've always bitten off more than I can chew and gone after things full force without uh, yeah. probably, you know, which is fun and not always the smartest thing, but it's you, you learn for certain to throw yourself into the fire. And, and, and uh, you know, I wrote a novel which is mediocre and sits on a shelf and will never be published. And, and maybe my son will discover it at some point, but it taught me how to write. And I've continued to write and I've enjoyed it and I've written a lot of short stories. And, and so with the uh, Unusual Creatures book, it was great. I mean, I love, oh, I'm going to get paid to write. And that's, yeah. you know, and here's the funny thing is, is the album came out and, uh, you know, I, I did weekend edition and did shows with it, and I think the New York Times wrote about it, and and it sold fairly well. I mean, it sold as well as an album of that sort of thing can sell in 2012 or whenever it came out. And the, then the book came out, and the book has been in its fourth printing, has been translated <laughs> into three languages, wow. led to this PBS series, and and I've got two more books on the way. And so I think there's some, you know, it. it I hate to be a sellout, but I do enjoy seeing things move and sell and make money. And of um, course, you know, so it's like I'm. And why not tie it into music? And and they're all passions of mine. It's all fun. I love to cook. Also, I love to paint. I mean, they're all. I think it's all the same synapses firing from the brain. Yeah, I agree. 
what are the two books that you have on the way? So in the same realm, uh, the follow-up essentially to Unusual Creatures is going to be a book called Extraordinary People. And it will feature 50 of uh, the world's most awesome people that I've decided I, they basically said you pick. Um, some are famous. Some are relatively unknown. Some are living. Some are dead all over the place. And then the book that I am – that book's done. That comes out next spring. Uh, the next book that I'm about to start working on is Curious Constructions, about 50 of the Earth's uh, strangest – constructions huh so yeah your whole thing of you like curious things yes uh wow man that sounds amazing <laughs> it's it's fun i mean every day there's never a dull moment at this point you know and you made reference to it and i think it really is true that you know you're having a child that's like although it does change constantly it's in flux yeah, constantly right. so even though it the, it's the same project it really is completely different well, yeah, phases I, I, of the I, same. I heed to your uh, yeah your step i mean i'm only a little a couple years ahead of you but man it is like not you know cuz changing all the time you can't believe how quickly things change it's a morphing change. project it never you never turn it in it just right. keeps morphing so you i don't think it, you'll get bored or tired of this project but it does seem like your kind of mo has been to do something throw yourself into it and then let it go and yeah. move on. Right. And uh, this, yeah, that starts to get very uh, psychoanalytical. And yeah, and, you know, this is one that, okay, I cannot let go of this one. And, and uh, you know, it's like, I, I don't think that'll ever happen. I mean, it's it's yeah. so much fun and so mysterious and watching these steps. And I mean, it's like I fall in love with my son more every single day and get, you know, just I, the problem is I go to the office at this point and I'm there for three or four hours and have a ton more work to do. But I start looking at pictures of my son and want to come home and hang out with him. And um, yeah, it, yeah, it's great. I mean, it's a wild ride. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks it's, for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's it's long overdue. I'm glad we had a chance to do it. Yeah, thanks, Leo. Yeah.